so this is going to be uh, on hyperbolic orientations. Um, and country again classes. Um, so, um, so th this is about uh, two papers that I put on the archive a few months ago. And uh, those are um, quite uh, heavily influenced by uh, the work of uh, Alexei Alanievsky on one hand, and also for the second part by uh, papers of uh, Panin and Walter. So we'll start with the brief introduction. Uh, so I guess around 1980, um, Arason computed um, the vid groups of the projective space. So uh, I was not around at the time, but uh, uh, retrospectively, my impression is that the uh, focus at the time, so it was uh, a bit outside of, uh, it was not mainline, I would say. So people were really interested in uh, field groups of fields. So I guess there's already a lot to say about this uh, without uh, introducing geometry in addition. Um, so that's mostly algebraic, I would say. And on the geometric side, people were mostly interested in what's now called uh, GL-oriented uh, cohomology theories. Like K-theory, Shaw groups, maybe Eladic cohomology, so on. So I guess it was only much later than maybe 2000 that uh, Balmer introduced a, a very efficient approach to bit groups. And then many people uh, contributed like uh, Stefan Giller, maybe Charles Walter, um, later uh, Lena Chef also, and many other people. And so I guess from this point, uh, people were already seeing vid groups as cohomology theories for varieties. Uh, but the, so the, the picture that it's quite different from uh, uh, GL-oriented cohomology theory. Um, so it's in a sense a quite uh, exotic uh, cohomology theory. I guess this was also already apparent from Arasan's computation of the feed groups of Pn. And so later, uh, Ananievsky, um, introduced a somewhat different point of view, I would say maybe more axiomatization. So he isolated uh, two properties of fit groups that uh, would go well together and allow to prove many things. So instead of just looking at fit groups, he looked at so-called eta periodic uh, SL oriented cohomology theories. So, uh, and I'd say that it was a quite a substantial advance, uh, at least for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because um, at least this is a generalization. So in principle, this allows to consider other theories than just field groups, even theories that are defined quite abstractly. Um, so, and still apply the same uh, machinery. So, but maybe more importantly, even if one is just interested in with groups, I guess this um, this uh, provided an axiomatic framework to to write proofs and so on. So this allows to write much cleaner proof, I guess, and also maybe 
better understand the hierarchy between the statements. Because I guess, uh, so, so vid groups are quite rich. So to prove a given statement, there are uh, many things that one can do with quadratic forms and so on. So, but, uh, so I guess this framework was quite uh, uh, convenient and efficient. So I'm going to, so first to explain a bit this terminology. So eta periodic uh, SL oriented. Um, so first about cohomology theory. So let me be a bit more precise now. So I guess we'll work over a base scheme S. So I would assume that this is a Noetherian of finite dimension. I think now, uh, Motivic homotopy theory works in an even more general setting, but I will restrict myself to this. And in fact, I guess already the case of uh, base field is interesting. So even the field is already interesting. So we have the stable homotopy category, SH, the motivic. Uh, and so we have a functor from uh, smooth schemes over S to uh, SHS. So adding a base point and then suspending, right? So, so in this talk, I will mostly omit to mention this functor and just think of smooth schemes as objects in SHS. Um, but now, so there are other types of objects, um, namely uh, the ring spectra. So let's say commutative ring spectra. And those essentially correspond to cohomology theory. So more precisely, those correspond to uh, representable cohomology theories um, so I guess it's possible to do what I'm going to do in a slightly more general way, uh, just by uh, defining abstractly what uh, axioms we want for cohomology theory. Uh, but yeah, I guess I would just uh, um, restrict myself to, to those uh, representable theories. So to spectrum A, the corresponding theory is defined as follows. So it's B graded. X is a scheme, so you first uh, suspend your scheme and then look at the morphism between X and suspension PQ of A. And so this, this defines, uh, let's say, groups for each X. And of course, this is functorial, so if you have a map like this of most schemes, this gives. Uh, pull back AX to AY. So I just omit uh, the grading when I uh, don't need it. Um, okay, so I need the notion of term spaces. So let me briefly recall the definition. So when you have a vector bundle E over X, so I just write VB for vector bundle. You can look at uh, the complement of the zero section. This is E zero. And then the term space is defined, if you want, as a motivic space as the quotient E by E zero, but you can also view this in SHS. And this allows to define the, the uh, cohomology with coefficients in E, just by replacing X by the term space of E. But somehow it, if R is the rank of E, so let's assume that R has constant rank, then it's convenient to shift 
the grading. Okay, uh, so there's one more thing I want to mention about Tom spaces is that this is functorial, uh, at least for isomorphisms. So vector bundles over X, then you have a map uh, TH alpha from THE to THF, let's say in SHS. Well, a particular case is the following. So the case of the trivial bundle or the base. So if you take an element, an invertible function of the base, so you have uh, an induced map, say TH lambda identity between TH1, TH1. And so the term space of the uh, trivial line bundle, this is the, so it's just A1 of a GM, so it's just a sphere, S21, right? So in particular, you can uh, desuspend this to get, so this is the notation, lambda bracket, the desuspension of this. And this is now an endomorphism of the sphere. The sphere spectrum. Okay, so that's notation that I will need. Um, another thing is uh, going to be the notion of uh, oriented bundles. So I guess giving an algebraic group, say linear algebraic group, you can, uh, G, you can define the notion of G orientation, I guess. And, uh, but in algebraic geometry, um, people mostly consider uh, four type of orientations. So let me just make them concrete. So the first one is a GL orientation. And this is just a vector bundle. So another one is SL orientation. And this is also a vector bundle plus additional data, namely an isomorphism between the trivial land bundle and the determinant. And so in particular, a cell-oriented bundle is a vector bundle with trivial determinant, uh, but the trivialization itself is part of the datum. Right? So a variation is the notion of SLC-oriented bundle. So it's a vector bundle plus say a land bundle L over X and an isomorphism L square, the determinant. Um, and finally, the last classical notion of orientation is symplectic. So it's a vector bundle plus a symplectic form non-degenerate symplectic form. I guess there are further things we can look at, say maybe orthogonal in orientation and so on, but mostly people were are interested in these uh, four types of orientation. And so once you have the notion of orientations of bundle, you can talk about orientation of theories of the ring spectra. And I guess the basic idea is to view uh, the Tom space as a twisted form of the base. Uh, so precisely, let, let's take a ring spectrum or cohomology theory. And well, G, one of these groups, 
GL, SL, SLC, SP. So a G orientation of A. is so the datum of a tom classes so of an element the in e zero zero x e so for each g oriented a bundle e well subject to the usual um, condition that I'm going to recall now. So it should be functorial. So pulling back the tongue pass is tongue pass or the pullback. It should also uh, be compatible with isomorphism of vector bundle. So let's say alpha poster THE F should be THE. And it should be multiplicative. So THE plus F should be the cup product. And there's also a normalization condition. So I guess TH1 should be one. So let's write sigma one to one in A0, zero, zero X one, but this is canonically isomorphic to A00X and the sigma two one is the notation for this isomorphism. So that's the element corresponding to one under the canonical isomorphism to A00X. And this is only when G is unequal to SP and otherwise, so the point is that the line bundle uh, admits no um, syntactic orientation in general. So in this case, we should look at the trivial bundle of one two of a similar condition. Okay, and so we have uh, defined four notions of orientations and they are logically related as follows, so if A is GL oriented, it is also SFC oriented. By this, I mean, if you have a, a GL oriented theory and an SFC bundle, you can forget that this is an SFC bundle and just think of it as a vector bundle and define its term class using the GL orientation. And you can further go to SL orientation and then to SP orientation. And uh, I think there are quite a few uh, interesting questions in this diagram. Uh, so, uh, namely to understand to, to which extent this implication are strict. So how we can try to say to lift orientations for instance, and uh, how can we classify such listings and so on. So that was, so in particular that uh, explained the notion of SL orientation. And the second point was the notion of eta periodicity. So here we look at the Hopf map, motivic Hopf map. So this is from A2 minus zero, maybe pointed to the, the P1, also pointed. And it's just the map sending XY to XY. And we say that the cohomology theory is eta periodic. A is eta periodic if well, the pullback along eta maybe the unpointed version is an isomorphism. So as a remark, you can view 
So if we look at the point inversion, so this is really a map between spheres. S32, S21. So in fact, you can view um, eta as an element of A, I guess, minus one, minus one of the base. And what well, the condition is that this element should be uh, invertible for the multiplication in AS. And in particular, uh, eta periodic theory are not just be graded, in fact, they are simply graded. So, you can recover the B grading from the Z grading by uh, using the periodicity. Well, another observation is that uh, when A is eta periodic, then the pullback from the point to P2 is an isomorphism. Um, Thus, so from this, you can deduce that if A is eta periodic plus GL oriented, so for GL oriented, you can also compute uh, A of PN. So you have the projective one of theorem, and you get that A of P2 is a free of rank three, right? But it's also free of rank one. So I guess this implies that A is zero. Um, so I think it's a quite uh, important observation. And um, so this says essentially that eta periodic theory are sort of orthogonal to the classical case of GL oriented theory. So it's a sort of um, uh, quite a pleasant situation that is maybe not so common. So we have the classical um, setting of GL oriented theory. And well, if we want to do something a bit different, we, we can just look at the eta periodic situation. We are sort of guaranteed to have to do something really different. And I guess it's not uh, often like this. So usually you, you would expect to if you want to do something uh, different, you would have to consider a sort of a strict generalization of the classical case. And here we can go in really in an orthogonal direction. And it turns out that the eta periodicity assumption uh, does uh, simplify things uh, quite a bit. So, so I guess in this talk, I will um, take a slightly different point of view. Uh, so if you take an element of SHS, not necessarily a ring spectrum, we'll say that this is eta periodic. If well, eta say which B, which identity. So this goes from B to S minus one minus one, which B is an isomorphism. So in SHS. So in this way, you can talk about eta periodic spectra and uh, and this, in fact, gives a category which I denote by SHS localized at eta. Uh, so it, it's not just obtained from SHS by inverting eta, but rather we can work uh, well, before taking the uh, homotopy category. So already at the level of spectra uh, by so called Bauss field localization. So the, the point is that this category, SHS, localized that eta is really the homotopy category of some uh, model category. Okay, so I guess I can state now uh, the first result. Uh, let's take a vector bundle of, of odd rank. Then, first of all, so the, the projection from the zero section uh, admits a section in SHS uh, eta. So of course, when uh, E admits a nowhere vanishing section, then this map has a section already at the scheme level. Uh, but the point is that in uh, when E has odd rank, 
it behaves as if it had a no vanishing section from the point of view of uh, SHS eta minus one. And the second sort of the complement to this is that if you look at the following diagram, so there are two projections to E0 and then there's one to X. You look at this in SHS, eta minus one, and this is a co-equalizer diagram. And by this, I really mean uh, in the homotopy category. Uh, so I, I would give a, explain how we can use this theorem. So essentially, E is some sort of well, splitting principle, and B is some sort of shift condition that allows to, to really do uh, constructions. But before maybe I, I can discuss, at least give some uh, ideas about the proof. And the strategy is to reduce to the case of a line bundle first. So I'm sorry, could you recall what is E0? So E0 is E minus zero section. Oh, thank you. I heard this version, but I wasn't sure. Um, so when E is a line bundle, so what is the point of looking at this case? So in this case, let's let's say that pi is the projection. Uh, then in general, pulling back along pi, maybe here this is L, pulling back along pi uh, has the effect of, well, adding a nowhere vanishing section, a tautological section, but when your bundle is a line bundle, this really means that it is trivial. And uh, so th there's still some work to do in this case, uh, but uh, yeah, I guess it's quite close to uh, things that uh, Alexei did. And, uh, and so in this way, we can get the case of um, line bundles. And to generalize to, so for the general case, we can proceed as follow. So you can essentially reduce to one using the following observation. So maybe a lemma. So the projection from P of E to X is an isomorphism when you invert eta. So recall that here we need, uh, we assume that rank E is odd. Uh, so once you've proved this, you can do the following. So you look at pi. So you look at projection from P of E, you know that this is an isomorphism. So over P of E, you have a vector a line bundle, so the tautological bundle O of minus one. And it turns out that the complement of the zero section is uh, canonically isomorphic to the complement of the zero section in E. So by one, the, so the case of line bundle, you have a section here and you deduce a section of the whole of pi, right? And as a note from this diagram, by just looking at the homotopy fibers, you see that the term space of, of E is isomorphic the term space of O of one, O of minus one. Okay, um, so now I'm going to give a few sample applications of this theorem. Um, so let's take- And the last, the last term space is something like terms uh, P of, uh, e plus one, right? So you're saying that here it should be E plus one? No, no, I mean that the sum space of all of minus one over projective space is the next projective space, something like that. No, no, I mean that everything is okay. I just wanted to say that the last ah. thing is also could be written something like P of some ah, right. other bundle. 
e plus something. Yeah, you can just, so instead of looking at the quotient of e by e0, you can look at, I guess, quotient of p of e plus one by p of e, right? Yeah, most, yeah, yeah. Most. I mean, I just want to say that you have the usual formula that if you take off minus one over projective space mm -hmm. and take it on space, then it will be projective space of the next dimension. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, and so this thing is probably projective, I mean, projectivization of E plus, I don't know, plus one, probably, something like that. I mean, the whole total zone space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was just a side remark. But, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, so let's take um, a tap periodic uh, commutative ring spectrum. Then um, every SL orientation of A is induced by a unique uh, SLC orientation. So as a remark, this is quite close to the result of the Alexei. Uh, he proved that SL orient in theory in general uh, admit it's called the term classes for SLC bundles. So this seems to be the same thing, but I guess the point is that so we, we can construct uh, those term isomorphisms, but it doesn't seem clear at all how we can check the um, multiplicativity, as far as I understand. Um, and it's sort of not surprising that if one axiom is making trouble, that should be the multiplicativity, it tends to be the most uh, subtle one. So, uh, but note that, uh, yeah, this is quite general without inverting eta. But the point is that if we invert eta, the situation becomes much better and uh, we can really, um, well, in fact, it's a different construction, but we, we can really obtain the, also the multiplicativity axiom. So maybe I would explain a bit how we do this. So you, you take an SLC bundle This means that you have a line bundle L and that is L square is isomorphic to uh, the determinant of you, right? So in, in general, this is, this is not an SL bundle, but if it happens that L is trivial, so assume that you have a trivialization of L, So this gives an SL orientation, namely, let's say F alpha. So you do the following one, this is one square. You can apply uh, alpha square, get to L square, and then use your isomorphism to get to the determinant. So in this way, you get uh, an SL orientation of E. So of course, in general, you don't have such a realization, but uh, you, you can uh, get one by just pulling back to L0. So you look at P pi projection from L0, then uh, pi upper star L admits uh, tautological trivialization, and you can use this to get an SL orientation of the pullback of E. 
And if you recall from the, from the previous statement, so A implies that in particular the pullback uh, admits a retraction, so in particular is injective. So this tells you that there is at most one way to define the Tom class of your SLC bundle compatibly with the given SL orientation. So this is the unicity part. Okay, so the, the existence is somewhat more interesting. Um, so you have to analyze what happens when you change the trivialization. So if you went from alpha to alpha prime, um, also from one to L, then when you change alpha by uh, uh, an invertible function, so alpha prime is lambda alpha with lambda an invertible function. And so what is F alpha prime? This is lambda square f alpha. And so it's easy to see that this implies that the Tom class of the SL bundle, uh, f alpha prime is well, this bracket lambda square Tom space of f alpha. And now we have the following uh, fundamental fact is that uh, bracket of squares is our trivial. So I guess that's how quadratic form come into the picture. And in particular, this gives you that you, you, this is the same um, term class, right? So now if you look at what B gives us, so this gives us an exact sequence like this. So you can pull back to A in zero. I'm just going to write E like this. I mean the pullback of E, and then you have two maps to. And well, this is an equalizer diagram. So to construct an element in A X E, what you can do is construct an element here whose image under the two pullbacks coincide. So you take your tautological trivialization. This gives you an SL structure on your bundle and thus a term class. And you have to check that the two pullback coincide, but so I guess in general, the two pullbacks of the tautological trivialization to there will not coincide. But we have seen that it's, it's not a problem because once you have one trivialization, um, the induced uh, term class for the induced uh, SL bundle will not be sensible to the choice of the trivialization. So this way you can descend to get an element there. So this gives existence. Okay. Um, so maybe another similar application is related to the following fact. So recall, so from vid groups that vid groups can be twisted by line bundles, but when you twist them by squares, this has no effects, right? For any line bundle L over X. I guess we, we can think of this as a manifestation of the SLC orientation, right? But in fact, it's uh, it follows already from the etap periodicity. So, and this is the following statement. If you take a vector bundle, say V and the line bundle, uh, then the term space of V is isomorphic to the term space of V tensor L square. You have a similar, say, additive version of this. So X is isomorphic to the term space of L plus L. So and this holds, of course, in SHS theta minus one. Um, so the, the proof is uh, similar. 
So essentially, you want to construct isomorphisms. And well, you can do this by first putting back to L0, and then uh, well, verify your shift condition. Right? But I just want to mention something that appears here. Um, so this uses the following dilemma, which I guess seems quite innocent. So if you take a vector bundle, say over S for simplicity of bank R and an element in, and in a function on S, invertible function, then, so you can look at homotacy by lambda in, inside the term space of V. And this turns out to be the same as lambda to the R. So R is the rank times identity. So as maps from the endomorphism of the term space of V. So I guess the statement looks quite uh, uh, very unsurprising, I would say. Uh, but uh, well, I was surprised to see that, uh, in fact, I cannot prove this unless I invert eta. So maybe I'm looking at this from the wrong angle. I don't know, but uh, um, yeah, the way I see it, there seems to be at least some subtlety. Yeah. Okay, so, but also another way of exploiting the theorem that I'm going to explain now so this is, I guess, just about the first part. So this implies that, so E0, so this projects to X and well, the, the, the homotopy cofiber of this up to shift is, uh, uh, I guess here you get the term space of E. Um, so, so essentially the section gives you uh, the, the search direction decomposition. So we call that here rank E is odd. So, and this can be exploited to, to do some computations, I guess, mostly in the case of a line bundle. Uh, and so, and in particular for classifying space. So I'm going to give a few examples involving computation of classifying spaces of algebraic groups. So I, I recall uh, we can do so we take a linear algebraic group over S. So and then there's a construction of BG by uh, well, Totaro, let's say in Morel and Wojewalski. So we look at approximations, say of as a smooth schemes of EG, say as motivic space. So here M is an um, integer. So those are smooth schemes with a free G action and we can look at the cushion, this is again, uh, smooth scheme that is BMG. And then we can define BG as the co-limit of those, co-limit computed as motivic spaces. Or if you, this is the same in this case as homotopy co-limit. Uh, sorry to have interrupted you. Could you briefly recall EMG uh, because uh, I'm uh, confused with uh, two versions of BG. Okay, so I probably I have to look up. Uh, so the, the idea is to, to take, um, uh, I guess, vector bundle or even a, a fine space of S. And the EMG is going to be an open in this fine space such that the complement has um, sufficiently small co dimension. So you, you have to. Uh, I don't remember the terminology of Morel Wojewski. Oh, oh, okay, okay, you follow uh, Morel Wojewski's paper, right? In your yeah, notation. That's correct, yes. Ah, okay, uh, brilliant, because uh, I, I have confused with another setting. Okay, perfect. 
So I don't remember what was the terminology, uh, but, but uh, yeah, admissible gadget or something like this, I think they called it. Uh, so I'm interested in, in the following situation. Assume given an exact sequence of algebraic groups. Uh, say one H G and G M. In other words, we take a group G and a character chi, which is subjective, and let H be the kernel, right? So in this situation, we're we are going to be able to relate BG and BH as follows. So you look at the following thing. You take your EMG, you see this is a free action and cross A1. So you take the quotient of this by the G action. So G acts on EMG, but it also acts on A1 using the character chi, right? And so this projects to EMG, so EMG cross A1, and when you take, and this is G equivalent, so this projects to BMG. And this was a line bundle, a trivial line bundle, and by this end, this is again a line bundle. And it turns out that the complement of the zero section is, well, one possible choice for BMH. So this gives us uh, the composition of BMG, sorry, of BMH as BMG plus well, the term space of LA. Uh, so, and of course we can go to the co-limit. So this is uh, compatible. So uh, we can just define and just set THL, just a notation and the co-limit as motivic space of THLM. And this gives us something like this. So I'm going to, to give a few uh, explicit application of this uh, formula. Um, so I guess the first application is um, the computation of classifying spaces of uh, diagonalizable groups in SH star minus one. So first of all, BGM is three is one. Oops. When n is odd, also uh, b nu n is one. When n is even, it's not trivial, but it's still not very complicated. This is just gm. Um, so I guess for a, uh, one has to, so BGM, this is P infinity. So essentially one has to compute uh, PN in SHS eta minus one, but this was essentially done by Ananievsky. So, and from this we can deduce, uh, so using B plus C, so you use the sequence uh, of course like this. Uh, so in particular in three, so the isomorphism is given by a certain map from GM to B nu N. And this map is, well, the map classifying a certain nu N torsor over GM. And of course, this is this torsor, right? Okay, uh, another, position is, to compare BSL and N and BSL and C. So we have seen that, uh, so this is in SHS eta minus one. We have seen that uh, SL orientation and SLC orientation are essentially the same thing when you invert eta. 
but in fact, also the classifying space of these groups are the same. So once you invert eta, it becomes quite difficult to distinguish between SL and SLC, let's say. So, and so for the proof, you recall the definition of SLNC. Uh, and so this is inside GLN plus GM, and this is uh, the set of pairs MT, where the determinant of M is the square of T. And so you look at the following sequence, one SLN, SLNC, GM, and this map is just MT goes to T. The kernel is the group of determinant one matrices, SLN. So here you have to compute a certain uh, term space and see that it vanishes once you invert eta. Well, one last uh, statement in this vein that would be useful. So in SHS, uh, minus one, you have, uh, so first of all, BGL 2R is isomorphic to BGL 2R plus one. Also BSL 2R, so it, you have a map to BGL 2R. So this is not an isomorphism, but this has a section. And C, in the odd case, this is an isomorphism. So let me just say that for B and C, you look at both the canonical sequence defining SLN using the determinant. So I guess this gives you B immediately. And so for C, you have to make some computation of certain term space to see that it vanishes. Okay. Um, so I guess now I will, uh, slowly move on to the second part. I guess this starts with the following result of Alexei. Um, so I guess this was stated for a spectrum of a field, characteristic different from two. But as far as I can see, this works uh, more generally. Uh, well, at least uh, as long as two is invertible seems to me that one has to modify maybe some argument when two is not invertible and it's not immediately clear to me how to do this, but yeah, uh, somehow there is in principle no reason why this shouldn't work when two is not invertible. So let A be an SL oriented eta periodic uh, commutative ring spectrum say a theory, then we, so Alexei computed A, B, S, L, N as follows, A, S. So you have to look at some kind of power series ring, P1, P, R, H, when N is two R plus one. And in the even case, you get PR minus one E. And so here, P1, PN are the contrarian classes. And E is the other class. So in the even case, it, it looks like you have no PR, but in fact, PR is E square. That's why it does not appear there. So this notation means that you look at uh, a power series ring, but of course, A of anything is going to be a graded, a bi-graded ring, and power series are not graded. So you should look at uh, something slightly different, the so-called homogeneous power series, which is a graded subring of power series. Uh, and so from this, uh, Levin computed uh, essentially E of BGLN. And this is uh, 
so now in both cases. So I think initially Levin so had some more assumptions. So I think he had some technical assumption on E. Uh, probably he was interested in the VIT groups and those technical assumptions are, are satisfied for the VIT groups. But in fact, and he deduced it from uh, Ananievsky theorem, but in fact, from using what I just explained you, we can deduce it immediately from theorem because PGR 2R is isomorphic by, I think this was A, to BGL 2R plus one, and by C, this is BSL 2R plus one. So we can just look at this. Okay, so this was, I guess this uh, uh, corollary of Levin was also one starting point for this work. Um, in the sense that uh, it appears somehow to be suboptimal, I would say. So uh, first of all, for instance, in the theorem, we have to distinguish cases, but in the end, in the corollary, there's just one case independently of the parity. So maybe it seems a bit strange to deduce this from the theorem. And I guess there are more serious uh, reasons, but for this, I, I need to explain a bit about Pontryagin classes. So how do we construct those uh, P1, PR? So you take a vector bundle without any structure and look at E plus the dual. Now this can be endowed with the canonical hyperbolic symplectic form. So, H V to V dual. And so we just define the Bontwagen classes of E. So those live in for I to I X as I guess there's a sign, and then we use the Borel class of this symplectic bundle. Yeah, it is. And so those BIs are the so-called Borel class, so defined by uh, Panin and Walter. And those are defined when a is SP oriented. So Pontryagin classes are defined for SP oriented theory, but if we come back to uh, the corollary here, we actually assume that A is SL oriented, which is uh, stronger. And so this does not seem to be quite the right setting. So this should be true for SP oriented theory, I guess. But uh, since we use uh, the theorem, and for the theorem, we really need the SL orientation, it's not clear how to make the proof work for SP uh, oriented theories. So I guess we could try to relate uh, BGL and BSP, but it seems much harder than to relate BGL and BSL. Uh, so th that's one first observation and a second one is that uh, somehow this is just about uh, characteristic classes of vector bundles without orientation. So this corollary here. And it seems a bit strange to require an, a symplectic orientation. So this seems to have nothing to do with any symplectic structure. And besides to even to define, so, okay, we need the boy classes, but uh, well, what we do, we construct a, a vector bundle V and just use the hyperbolic uh, symplectic form, which does not really carry much uh, symplectic information, I would say. So that's basically the idea of uh, so-called, what I call hyperbolic orientations. Sorry, small remark, your bi-gradient is twice off, I think. So here this should be eight. eight. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's correct. 
if I take two I. Um, so this is the minimal data that you that is needed. So minimal data required to define Pontryagin classes. So even if, as I said, uh, so for on V, we just need sort of the hyperbolic form, which does not carry much symplectic orientation. Still, in order to define Boyle classes, we need to uh, work like with universal symplectic bundles, which do carry non-trivial uh, symplectic structure. So it's not completely immediate how to make this work. Uh, but in fact, it, it does work, but one has to start from, from scratch again. So the picture is the following. You had um, GL orientations. And those correspond to Chan classes. So this was uh, extensively uh, studied by Panin. So he also, uh, describes uh, several more equivalent structures. And there's a very similar picture for SP orientations corresponding to Borel classes. And this was uh, the work of Panin Walter. And here the idea is that we want to look at Pontryagin classes so what corresponds to Pontryagin classes? So this is this notion of hyperbolic orientation. And I'd say that the, the, the correspondence is uh, uh, just as strong as the correspondence for the other one. So we have uh, again, several equivalent structure that we will see, but there is a big, uh, caveat somehow. So I guess it's one of the main limitation of this works. So this works only uh, when eta is inverted. Whereas for the first two lines, there is no assumption about eta. But for hyperbolic orientations and Pontryagin classes, we really need eta inverted. And, uh, I think that there is no obvious way of uh, removing this assumption. So, so let me define properly the notion of hyperbolic uh, orientation. So you take uh, the commutative ring spectrum. So the idea is to associate to each vector bundle over X. Uh, so just like for orientation, uh, uh, an element which we denote by HE in A0, 0. But I guess here, here the main innovation is that we twist by E plus E. So for all other notion of orientation, we just take a vector bundle with some additional structure and then define a term class in the cohomology of the term space of that bundle. But in fact, we could also take, uh, I mean, produce any vector bundle out of our original bundle and then look at the term class of this new bundle. And the condition are what you expect. So um, this should be functorial. compatible with isomorphisms. Also uh, multiplicative in the following sense, H E plus F should be H E. So here we have to be a bit careful because the left hand side is in E plus F plus E plus F. 
while the right hand side is in E plus E plus F plus E. Set. So, but we identify those using the twist, uh, the exchange map for the middle factors. And there's a normalization axiom H1 is, I guess, sigma four to one. Okay, so that's very similar to the previous notion of orientations. And in fact, it's a weaker notion. So if A is SP oriented, then it is also hyperbolically oriented. So somehow this new type of orientation fits on the right in the logical diagram that I wrote before. And the, the way this is done, so, Generally, we look at this. So we have, we can think of E plus E as endowed with the hyperbolic symplectic form. So we have a class for the SP orientation there, H. And this is canonically isomorphic to A X plus E plus E. And so this is our H. And uh, so, Note that we can play the same game, say, for O orientation that I didn't define, but so you can also use the hyperbolic orthogonal form if you have a O orientation. Uh, so from this point of view, it seems maybe strange to use E plus E instead of E plus E dual in the definition. But I guess it's, it's in fact internally much more consistent. So if you forget about the example, it's, I guess, much more natural to do this in the sense that uh, when the need for the hyperbolic orientation will appear, what appears is really this. So, so I mean, we know I have to use this isomorphism. So what can you do with this? Uh, what the sort of the first, obvious thing that you can do, you, you start with uh, this, your element HE, you can go to uh, E, so R is the rank of E, to R, R, X, E, using the zero section of one of the bundles, so maybe the first, the second one, and so HE would pull back to something which is called, so this is the earlier class. And you can further go using the zero section to a 4R, 2R, X. And this is what I would call the Pontre again class. Maybe the top in class P of E. Uh, so I guess you can observe that this is compatible with various uh, previous definitions of earlier classes and prove why the various um, uh, basic properties of those class. I will just mention one. Namely, you expect the square of the top class of the earlier class to be the top entry again class. And this is true in the following sense. If you take the square of this, this is the E cup H. So it's not very difficult, but it's not, I'd say it's not completely formal. So we have to work a bit with matrices to see this. Okay, so now um, I'd like to give maybe one of the main uh, results. And I guess the best way to state it is to well, introduce a, a variant of the notion of hyperbolic orientation. So, so called weak hyperbolic orientation. So it's essentially the same thing, except you restrict yourself to rank two bundles. So rank two vector bundle, you associate um, the class. And 
and it verifies essentially the same axioms. So A is functorial. B, uh, if you have an isomorphism, so it is compatible with isomorphisms. And C, the, so the point is that now you, you cannot formulate the multiplicativity axioms because if you take the direct sum of two rank two bundles, it's not anymore rank two, right? So we just keep this axiom and for the normalization, you have to modify it also slightly. Um, yeah, so the point of this definition is to express the following result. Uh, so assume that A is eta periodic. So this is a, a, a commutative ring spectrum. Then what the hyperbolic orientations of A are in one one correspondences with the weak hyperbolic orientations. Uh, so I'd say this is one of the main results and so it, this is not at all formal, right? So, of course, uh, hyperbolic orientation induces a weak hyperbolic orientation, but if we start with the weak hyperbolic orientation, it's not at all clear. Uh, well, how, so first of all, how to extend this to a higher rank, but this is going to be uh, the projective bundle theorem that I will mention in a minute. But more seriously, the to get the multiplicativity axiom is sort of uh, requires some work. And so in particular, this uses the um, higher Pontryagin, Pontryagin classes that I will define in a minute. And so I guess concretely this theorem, at least in principle, is quite useful because if you want to construct a hyperbolic orientation, you just have to construct a weak hyperbolic orientation and this is substantially easier, right? You don't have to check the multiplicative axiom and you can also just look at rank two bundles. Okay, so as a remark, I'd say that uh, there is one yeah. more. Small, yeah, yes. another small question. Uh, I mean, uh, just from the definition, it is not obvious why you should start here from rank two, right? But rank one are kind of a trivial, right? I mean, uh, in the eta inverted uh, category, yes. as you said. Uh, I mean, uh, I will suppose I want to give another definition of the hyperbolic orientation starting from rank one bundle. Uh, is it? But okay? I guess so, so. From the definition of so, the, this yeah. is there is no choice for the for the rank one. It's part of the definition that you have this. Right. So right. Yeah, because rank one are, are trivial ones. Yeah. I mean, every line bundle, as you said, is more or less trivial. Yeah. So there, there is no, nothing interesting happening. Okay. So but it always has some classes, trivial ones. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So I was saying that there's one more uh, equivalent structure. That, that I'm not going to define in detail, but this is the notion of Pontryagin structure. Where instead of uh, specifying, so instead of this term class, we can specify the Pontryagin classes if we prefer. Uh, so of rank two bundles, right? And this should satisfy a similar condition, similar to A and B. I guess for C, we have to formulate it slightly differently. 
And then it's not very hard to see that those so weak hyperbolic orientation and proteagon structure are the same thing. But I guess the result is really that this is the same thing as hyperbolic orientation. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, explain how we get higher Montreagin uh, classes. And this is essentially following a Goltendik method. So what he constructed higher chain classes saying in CH form uh, the first classes, so from the first chain classes of line bundles. So sort of in short theory, it's it's quite clear how you want to define first chain classes of line bundle because of the relation with divisors. And then he has uh, this uh, formal way of, uh, of uh, extending this automatically to higher um, chain classes and the key thing was the projective bundle theorem, which I will recall. So if A is GL oriented and say you take a vector bundle of rank R, then you can compute A of P of E. This is a free the S module on one X, X R minus one, where X is the first gen class of this here, we need O of one. And then to define the higher chain classes, he sets C zero one and define C1, CR by the usual formula. So essentially you look at X to the R. So it's not anymore in this basis. So it can ex be expressed as a linear combination of elements in the basis. And the coefficients are up to sign uh, the chain classes of E. Okay, so we can use essentially the same uh, um, strategy, but we have to change just one thing. So from GL oriented to hyperbolically oriented. So instead of line bundles, we want to consider rank two bundles. And so instead of P of one, P of E, O of one, we want to consider the Grassmannian two planes in E and the corresponding tautological bundle. And then things are essentially the same. So we have, uh, so let's say that from now on, A is uh, eta periodic. Uh, hyperbolically oriented commutative ring spectrum. And so we have the analog of the projective bundle theorem. So you take a vector bundle of long, say 2D or 2D plus one, then so you can compute the cohomology of the Grassmannian of two planes. This is a free ES module on the basis one pi pi d minus one, where pi is the Pontryagin class of U2, the tautological bundle on two. Uh, and just as for, the projective bundle theorem, the idea is to first look at the case when E is trivial. So we look at the Grassmannian of two planes in say, uh, 
R space. And then we can use induction on R to compute this. And then it turns out that this computation globalizes. First of all, because we had a free module. And second, because those classes, so those class pi, uh, does globalize sort of by uh, assumption that we have a hyperbolic orientation. Well, as a remark, we get, uh, so for this, we really need uh, orientation, right? To construct these classes, but there's still one case with, that we get without orientation. This is GR24. I think from this, we get the following decomposition. Ready in SH, we invert eta. Well, anyway, so th this gives uh, just as above contrary in classes. E I E. So here, I guess. I guess I need for i to i x. And so if we look at uh, the, the total class, so this is convenient to express. Uh, the, the basic properties of those Pontryagin classes. Uh, so those can be summarized as, as follows. So if the rank of E is 2D, so we have PD uh, of E, which is pi of E. So I guess here, yeah, yeah, as before, we really need 8I for I. So here, this is going to live in uh, E8D. Um, so if um, L is a sub-bundle, a line sub-bundle, then P, the total class of E is the same as the total class of the quotient. So in particular, this includes uh, the stability, right? So in particular, PE plus one is just PE. We have the Cartan formula. E, e plus F is P, e, F. And one more thing is that P of E dual is the same as P of E. Okay, uh, so those are the basic properties of Pottery classes. And well, in so th this uh, projective bundle theorem also gives us a splitting principle I'm going to express now. So when you take a vector bundle, say of constant rank, Then there exists so a map uh, smooth and E one E R um, vector bundles of a Y such that so first of all the pullback is injective, in fact, admits a retraction. Uh, to F plus the pullback of E splits as a direct sum of those bundles. And those bundles well, are either trivial or SL2 bundles. So rank EI is one or two and the determinant is trivial. So in case rank one, this means that EI is trivial. Otherwise, it means that it's an SL2 bundle. 
So as a corollary of this splitting principle, we get that each SP orientation of an eta periodic theory is induced by at most one SL orientation. So it's not completely clear whether we can really reconstruct um, the orientation, but at least there is, we can show that there is at most one from this. And you see, so this corollary, uh, so the statement doesn't involve um, hyperbolic orientations, uh, but, but the, the proof does somehow. Another corollary is that we finally can, uh, maybe not corollary the theorem, that we can uh, compute A of BGLN in this setting and get the expected answer. And again, this is uh, this in particular says something which has nothing to do with uh, hyperbolic orientation. This holds for SP oriented. Okay, so there's one one last thing that I wanted to mention. So this is the universal theory. So there's what would be called the hyperbolic cobordism. So MH. So I guess here I need to assume slightly more on S, probably to be on the C side regular and separated. And this is very similar to the construction is very similar to Voivodsky uh, MGL. But yeah, instead of the term space, so we look at the following thing, THNS. So instead of looking at the term space of the universal bundle, we look at the term space of two copies. So this is the universal bundle. So the rank N sub bundle of the trivial bundle of rank S. And then we can look at MHN as the co-limit over S. So the co-limit as motivic space. And uh, so we, we want to use this to construct a spectrum. So this is going to be level N. We can do the following. So we, we T2 smash MHN to MHN plus one. This is induced by sort of the obvious map that sends so already at the level of Grassmannians that sends a sub bundle uh, of E of one S to where you just add a copy of one. And this induces a map on term spaces and well, this gives you exactly a map like this. So this yields, let's say a T2 spectrum MH, and well, in fact, uh, it turns out that T2 spectrum are the same thing as T spectra, so this gives you an element in SHS. And um, slightly more uh, technical result is that this is a ring spectrum. So in fact, this is uh, a hyperbolically oriented ring spectrum. Commutative. So 
So the part about the hyperbolic orientation is sort of tautological from the construction. It's really constructed to have such an orientation. Uh, so the, the construction of the uh, ring spectral structure is slightly more uh, subtle, but uh, sort of this problem has been solved by other people. So I guess you can look at uh, um, symmetric spectra and uh, give a structure of symmetric spectrum and from this uh, be able to uh, define a structure of commutative ring spectrum. So this is quite similar to, I guess, what uh, um, uh, Banning Walter did. Um, but in any case, uh, so that's uh, an example of a hyperbolically oriented theory. And, and the result is that this is um, the universal one. So let E be eta periodic. So until now, we didn't need eta periodicity, but for the universality, we do. Mutative ring spectrum. Then, the hyperbolic orientations of A are in one one correspondence with morphisms of ring spectra. MH to A. Uh, so I guess it's quite clear that if you have a morphism of ring spectra, you get a hyperbolic orientation, but uh, well, on the other direction, it's a bit more subtle. Uh, one, one point I'd like to mention is that here, the assumption that A be commutative uh, seems to be uh, quite important. So uh, from the beginning, I assumed that my ring spectra were commutative, but that was not really a serious assumption in the sense that you can remove it easily, but here I don't know how to remove it. So for the universality statement. Okay, so I guess I will stop here. Thank you.